it's just like mine. That's excellent. All right, so this talk is called Digital Sandwich Generation. Sadly, it is not about generating sandwiches digitally. It is about uh, digital identity management, especially as it relates to women's relationships with their family. This is a sandwich. There are other sandwiches that are not like it. Not all of the stories I'm saying here are representative of every family. I'm just using some general examples. So don't feel bad if your examples are not there. I don't have any speaker notes, so that's going to be super. Whoop. So as a mother, I put baby's first Amazon wish list online, and I took and curated a bunch of baby pictures, and I had cutesy in utero posts on LiveJournal from people who were still in my womb. And I was really like on top of this whole digital identity management for small children. As a daughter, my parents call me up and say things like, so tell me again what two-factor authentication is. <laughs> or when are you going to come out and fix the surround sound? My parents are actually pretty technical and my siblings are technical, so we distribute the load. Like my brother is strictly in charge of wireless. None of the rest of us touch the wireless. That's my brother's job. But uh, I, I end up with a lot of sort of computer security questions. So when I was putting this talk together, I was like, well, there's some things you need to know about managing digital identities for adults, like older adults, and there's some things you need to know for kids. And then I made the list, and the Venn diagram sort of overlapped in the middle. So here are the things that you need to know for everyone. Identity, names, and pseudonyms. Who do you think is scarier? Tar Tom Marvello Riddle, or I am Lord Voldemort? They're the same person under different names. And I think it's really important that we understand that to every wizard, true names have power. When you apply for a job, or go on a date, or meet somebody interesting at a conference, the first thing they're going to do is Google you. That ties in to your identity like a credit check. At least when you Google yourself, it's free, unlike the credit check agencies, which are actually charging you. But they're always going to Google the name that you've given them. If you don't want something on your permanent record in the like threatening school sense, don't use your real name to do it. I have several different identities that I use for different personas, and um, I use my real name for things that I consider professionally important and keep it out of things that are going to be professionally problematic. There's also a persistent pseudonym. I call this the doing business as. Sometimes you are Clark Kent and sometimes you are Superman and it is important to be clear on what you are doing business as. The next problem that everyone has is authenticity. How do you know something that you read on the internet is true? I read this cool book by Chip and Dan Heath called Made to Stick, and they gave me a metric for why some stories stick with us and some don't. Sticky stories are simple enough to comprehend, surprising or, or startling somehow, concrete or tangible, believable, they have an emotional tie, and they are narrative, they tell a story. I got an email from a friend of mine saying, help, I was mugged in Spain and I don't have any money and I really need some to get home and I'm in real trouble. And this friend travels internationally for business, so I thought it was actually not implausible that they were in Spain right then. They weren't super close. They were like, you know, not so far that I wouldn't ever send them money, but not so close that I knew which country they were in. And I thought, before I wire anybody money, I'm going to make sure where they are. So I, I contacted a mutual friend of ours and I said, so where are they? And they're like, Australia. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's a scam where somebody has gotten a hold of their email address book and emailed me to ask for money that will get, then get diverted. If I hadn't stopped and checked, I would have sent money to the wrong person and uh, been victimized by online spoofing. So that, that second angle of attack is pretty important. The next thing that I want everybody to understand is passwords and password keepers. Our brains are not actually terribly good at retaining cryptographically secure passwords. 
we've got a lot of other things going on. So what we do is we make passwords that are really similar to each other, or we use one password across a lot of different websites. And everyone who does internet security has just buried their face in their hands, either because they do it themselves and know better, <laughs> or because they really hope you aren't doing that. What a password keeper does, I use LastPass, but there are several good password keepers out there, is gives you one master key that allows you to keep all of your passwords in one place. They call it a vault. And every time you go to some throwaway site, they're like, do you want to enter a password or we could generate one for you? And that key combination, the username and password, is stored in your vault, which is accessed by one password that you, you have to remember. Losing that one password is terrible, don't do it. The next thing I want to tell everyone about is there is, there, as, as the great problematic Heinlein said, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. No website is free. There are servers that cost money, there is electricity that costs money, there are wires and routers and all sorts of infrastructure that makes the internet work. And someone somewhere is paying for that. So, you have to ask yourself, who's getting the money and how? This is a picture of the uh, diary from Harry Potter. When the diary started talking to Ginny, she didn't feel suspicious of this because it was something she was intimate with. And she had long conversations with this diary, but the diary had its own agenda. We need to think about what the agenda of our personal diaries, of our websites is, because someone somewhere is making money. Sorry. Um, so are they making money from advertising? Are they making money from mining your data? Like the classmates.com thing is all about mining your data and selling it to other people in neat little packages. Is it about future revenue? There are a bunch of things out there that are gathering a user base that is then saleable as part of their company. So even if a startup site doesn't have any ads and doesn't seem to be asking a lot of questions, you've still been added to their active user database and you are part of their assets. So, you know, take a couple minutes to see if you can figure out, especially for sites you use really often, how it is being monetized. A couple years ago, I was looking at working for Twitter, well, like four years ago, and I wouldn't do it because I couldn't figure out how they were making their money. I'm like, they're going to have to make money somehow. Merely allowing us to change the world by talking to each other is not going to pay the bills. So, whatever horrible way they're going to monetize, I can't see it yet. And so far, they've monetized by doing sponsored tweets, which is not so bad. It's not great, but it's not so bad. But I feel like there's probably more coming down the line. So, I said we were going to talk about being a sandwich. The top layer of the sandwich is our elders. This is a picture of my dad and my daughter. And our elders are people who taught us to put on our socks and ride our bikes and behave ourselves in the world. And eventually there comes a point when they're going to need our help too. If we give them the tools, that they need to be competent digital citizens, then they can take better care of us and everybody's happy. The first one, and this is hard, I hope it's a long time coming for all of us, is eventually you're going to have to close out your parents' accounts and deal with their estate, both physical and digital. And we have good scripts for how to deal with your parents' stuff, like you get together with your siblings and you split it up and you donate some stuff but we have very few scripts on what you do with dad's Amazon account. So remember when I was talking about password keepers? This is a great time to encourage your parents to set up a password keeper, write the password down, and stick it someplace that you can find. My parents keep theirs in a hymnal. <laughs> um, I, that, that would be a security flaw, but uh, there are 50 hymnals in my parents' house, so probably I'm going to be okay. Um, but think about how it's going to be to get all of that stuff shut down and turned off. 
Another thing is retired people have a bunch of time and a bunch of energy that they're no longer directing toward work. Encourage them to do some preservation work. Encourage them to write down the names of the people in the pictures. Encourage them to write down some stories, record some stories, do some stuff. Um, if you wait too long until they're old, old, it's going to be a lot harder to digitally preserve that data. Who recognizes all of these disks? Yeah. I've only used two of the three. I have not used the, the monstrous eight and a half inch there. But, <laughs> but uh, who, can, who has a drive that can recognize these? Right. So if your family photos, your family recipes, your uh, important financial data is stored on something like this or on a hard drive but in Lotus 123 format, it is no longer accessible. One of the things that we need to teach our elders is that they need to continue updating their file formats and their physical media so that we don't lose that information to what the Library of Congress calls bit rot. So this one's really hard. I, the odds are some of you are already dealing with this. Sometimes our parents have diminished capacity or ability to con consent to something. This used to just mean they would ask you 40 million times if you wanted to play checkers, no matter what you said. But now they have a smartphone and a one-click buy button. And unless we think about how we're going to handle that, we're going to get a nasty shock when the Amazon guy shows up. Um, some people have put net nannies on their parents' computers. Some people have used child locks to lock their parents' phones so that they can't call inappropriate numbers or buy inappropriate things. Some people are using two-factor authentication to just double check and verify that this is something that parent is actually like consciously purchasing. But whatever it is, it's going to be hard for you to deal with and it's probably going to come up sometime before you legally have custody of your parents. And um, I just don't want you to be surprised. Like, this is going to happen to all of us at some point. And we have to think about it before we're deep in the emotional weeds. So I have awesome kids. Hey, kids, wave. Wave to the nice people. I brought my kids. This is the first tech talk they've ever seen me give, so I'm excited about it. Um, so as a mom, I have a lot of training to do, including putting on socks and teaching people to ride bikes, but also some other stuff. The first one is, if you have little kids, you need to understand that you are projecting their digital identity out of your own. That doesn't mean that it doesn't reflect on them. If you use a child's real name attached to a picture, not only is it like stranger danger predator, which is actually the least of my worries, it also means that if I attach this kid's real name to it, when his employer Googles him, He's going to get adorable childhood photos. And I picked all of the adorable childhood photos that are fully clothed. Um, <laughs> but if you have parents who are like me, there are some adorable childhood photos wearing nothing but like bubble hat. Uh, no, nobody wants their employer or next date to see that. So you have to really be careful not to attach a child's real name to their photos. The next one is you have to be willing to take down a photo when a kid asks you. At some point, they're going to find your digital online album and they'll go, Mom, that's, that's humiliating. Will you please take it down because I'm 10? And, and that kid has like pigtails. Stop it. And it is so hard for us to detach how we felt at that time from who they are as people now. Like, how do we separate ourselves from them? Well, I have news for you. This is an ongoing process. <laughs> but it's really important to do. So if they say take it down, take it down. And before you tell a story or post a picture of a child who is entering sort of the age of consent, which is six or so, for at least for my kids, you should ask them. You, you should say, hey, can I use that funny story about that time you wore nothing but bubbles? Um, because I'm going to tell the entire internet about it. <laughs> and. Um, so this is a picture of a kid sleeping. I obviously didn't ask his permission to take his photo. So you have to be 
considerate about the fact that these are still people who still have like emotional rights to their image and their portrayal. The next thing is keep it secret, keep it safe. There are some things you should train your kids never to tell anyone online just because it's like a spinal level reflex for adults and kids. You should never without good reason disclose your real name or your age. In fact, lots of kids games will block the entire set of numbers. Like you can't use numbers uh, because they don't want kids disclosing their age. Uh, you should never say where exactly you live or what your schedule is. And these are just like some basic reflexive safety things that we should all use, but it's especially important for kids because they don't have the same bullshit sensors that adults do. Is that five? Sorry. No, okay. Um, so I'm gonna tell a story about Baz. Um, when he was six or so, he had a friend online on Roblox and they had sort of a, a financial friendship where he mined all the stuff and gave the goodies to his friend and his friend was really friendly with him and, and dad and I were a little suspicious about this but you know, you, you gotta learn this sometime and it's not really harmful. And then the friend wanted to meet him and wanted to know where he lived and was going to come out and visit and it was all very exciting and we're like, you can't tell him where you live, you can't, we'll meet someplace else, you can't tell him. And then he got stood up, which made dad and I not at all surprised, and Sebastian was crushed because when you're six and your friend stands you up, you don't understand why it happened. And he kept stringing him along and getting more goods from him, and eventually, <laughs> oh, Sebastian would like to dispute this, um, but eventually the friendship broke up and I was just relieved that no vital information had been transmitted. And this is just like one little story of sort of future-proofing your kids. So the next thing is also about future-proofing your kids. Mickey talked a lot about 15-year-olds who are behaving badly on the internet, and I'm really terrified of raising the next generation of trolls. It would be really easy, and I know this because I had my own trollish moments, which fortunately occurred in the BBS days, and there are no records of them, but it's possible I was not an entirely polite person. So I'm ingraining in my children this rule. Is it true? Is it necessary? Is it kind? If it is not at least two of those three things, why are you saying it? If it is not true and kind, why would you say it? It might be true that somebody has toilet paper off their, their shoe, but if they're not going anywhere, why embarrass them? So this trifecta of, of consideration was simple enough to teach like a five-year-old. Like, is it true? Do you need to say it? Is it nice to say? Um, and yet I think scales to adulthood. Like, is it true? Is it necessary? Is it kind? So the other thing that I really want to teach children, this is a troll face for those who, who have somehow missed the horrible phenomena of the internet. Um, the other thing that I really want to teach my kids is that online is real life. I never want to say to them, oh, well, that's just an online friend. Oh, you can ignore that because it's just people on the internet. If I teach them that they are not engaging in the internet as an honest activity, then when they go out, they're not going to believe people on the other side of the screen are real. And I really think it's important. I met my spouse online. I, I blogged the children into life. Like, there's so much of my life that's online. And to say online life is not real is a lie, and it leads to damaged relationships online. So, the sandwich is kind of intimidating. We're, we're squashed on both sides sometimes. But sometimes you eat the sandwich instead of the sandwich eating you. <laughs> so I don't know how much time I have left. No time. No time. Perfect.